Hello once again, this is Antonio, and I'm coming at you with another exciting video. Now, lately I've been cooking on this channel. Alright, I just did a video on yesterday talking about black cities or black towns or black communities specifically that had to be given up between eminent domain or the KKK took over the dwellings and flooded the whole black town. So, for example, what we discussed, Lake Lanier is and was a black town. And the reason why I say is because under the lake, the black town is still there. So in this video, we're going to speak about five trailblazers that contributed to the railroad system. Some of these people protected cargo. Some of the people actually um, had the very own railroad. See, a lot of people come to this country. They migrate here and they see the conditions that black people are in now. But little do people know that some black people were better off in the 1800s. Some people really think that black people never contributed to anything to this country. Some people even think that we are lazily and shiftless for real. I don't know any dummies around me. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter what walk of life or black. I don't know any dummies around me, but I spoke about that. Also, I spoke about I have another video talking about the uh, five unsung heroes that actually black Americans that actually have saved communities. So with all that being said, we're going to talk about the five trailblazers that contributed to the railroad system. And um, I have been rambling enough. So let's go in and talk about this gentleman who was once considered the Black Edison. His name is Granville T. Woods. Uh, this is not my video, but I am using it as fair use. And let's go and cook on this channel. Here we go. To free black parents. He was a very adept and very smart guy. And in 1872, he got a job working for a local railroad. He managed to work in an understanding of both mechanical as well as the rudiments of what will later become electrical engineering. By the early 1880s, he's left the railroads and he's worked going off to become an independent inventor. Woods is going to have a variety of patents for a number of different kinds of things. His most famous single invention is the multiplex telegraph. The problem that railroads had in those days was that they didn't have a way to easily communicate one with another. So if you were driving a train along at 50 mile an hour, you had no way of knowing if there was a stopped train right around that bend. What this meant was that there are a lot of train accidents. One of the things that Woods comes up with is a telegraph system that permits messages on a moving train to basically be transmitted wirelessly to a, a telegraph line running along the side of the train tracks. What this means is the trains can talk to each other. And so a lot of trains and lives are saved because of that particular invention. Woods by this time had moved to New York City with friends and relatives. He had set up the Woods Electric Company, and that company was quite successful all the way up until the time of Woods' death. Woods suffered a stroke in 1910, by the time he dies, he has more than 60 patents. He is still considered today by electrical engineering organizations, university engineering departments, to be one of the most creative and prolific inventors in America, regardless of race. Okay. So what we're going to do briefly, let's go and look at some of Graham T. Wood's inventions before we get to the next slide, so to speak. I remember in school, we had slides, right? Um, let's discuss some of his uh, inventions. Let's see if we can just see some of his inventions on some of the things that he, you know, innovated in this country. All right, so he was known as the Black Edison, right? Granville Woods was an, a Black American inventor. 
who made very key contributions to the development of the telephone, streetcar, and more. All right. So let's go ahead and cook some of this. So let's talk about some of his early inventing career, right? We have another inventor out of Ohio, I believe. Um, um, uh, Garrett Morgan, I believe he's from Ohio as well. But living in Cincinnati, Woods eventually set up his own company to develop, manufacture, and sell electrical apparatus. And in 1889, he filled his first, he filed his first patent for an improved stem baller furnace. He later patents more mainly for electrical devices, including the second invention, an improved telephone transmitter. All right. The patent was the device which combined the telephone and the telegraph was bought by Alexander Graham. And you see right there, right? I'm not dissing Alexander Graham Bell and his contributions, but they never tell you about Granville T. Woods and, the, you know, the, the inventions that he contributed, nor do they speak about Lewis Lattimore, who contributed to the telephone system as well. They always say in school, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, but it never, comma, this happened, this happened. And the payment freed Woods to devote himself to his own research. One of his most important uh, in, inventions was the trawler, a groove metal wheel that allowed streetcars, later known as trolleys, to collect electric power from overhead wires. And think about one of the, the places that has this most is in America. I'm just sp speaking about America, San Francisco. They use that to the fullest, that trolley system in San Francisco. All right. Wood's most important in, uh, invention was the multiplex telegraph, also known as the induction telegraph or block system in 1880 system, 1880 system, 1887. The device allowed men to communicate communicate by voice over telegraph wires ultimately helping to speed up important communications and subsequently preventing crucial errors such as train accidents nobody never taught me in school that's why i'm making this video that sounds like a walkie talkie to the fullest right so the induction telegraph sounds like a walkie talkie in a sense right that's what we called it and that's what it what it boils down to. We don't speak about these inventions. Woods defeated Edison's. Okay, so uh, Woods defeated Edison's lawsuit that that challenged his patent and turned down Edison's offer to make him a partner. <laughs> he didn't need you, Tommy boy. Thereafter, Woods was often known as Black Edison because Edison challenged him. Edison lost in court. And then Edison say, can't beat him, join him. And then Gra uh, Granville say, hell no, nah, we not joining each other. I can do this on my own. All right. After receiving the patent for the multiplex telegraph, Woods reorganized the Cincinnati company as Woods Electric Co. Never knew this. Nobody ever taught this. No, indeed. Didn't anybody ever teach this ever to me in my day of life? They say Thomas Edison electric and that's case closed they don't teach you about the and 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 all right what's next most important invention was the power pickup device in 1901 which is in the basis of the so-called third rail currently used by electric power transit systems from 1902 to 1905 he received patents for an improved air brake system all right so we definitely got to get down and speak about the next person. But, but, but here's the thing. Why are you making this video? I'm making this video because these are things that I have never been taught. Ever been taught. Maybe you have. But I have never been taught a day in my life about Granville T. Woods. Not one day of my life. Um... And a lot of times my videos don't do very good on maybe I need to pay a little money and get them pushed out into the YouTube universe. But let's talk about the person that I have known a lot about. And that's Elijah McCoy. 
how he revolutionized the, the train railroad system. Journey through the life and accomplishments of Elijah McCoy, a prolific inventor and trailblazer. Ever wondered how his innovations revolutionized the industrial landscape? Stay tuned to uncover the remarkable story. Welcome, history enthusiasts. Today, we delve into the inspiring life and groundbreaking accomplishments of Elijah McCoy, an unsung hero of innovation. From his early struggles to becoming a prolific inventor, McCoy's legacy has left an indelible mark on the industrial landscape. Join us as we explore the remarkable journey of a man whose ingenious inventions revolutionized how we live and work. However, before we start our video, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for all of our upcoming uploads. So, without further ado, let's get started. Bodhi Early Life and Struggles Elijah McCoy's early life was marked by both adversity and an innate brilliance that would later define his legacy. Born in Colchester, Ontario, Canada, in 1844 to parents who had escaped slavery through the Underground Railroad, McCoy faced the dual challenges of being a person of African descent in a racially divided society and overcoming economic hardship. Despite facing racial barriers, McCoy's aptitude for mechanics and engineering became evident early on. His passion for invention led him to pursue formal education in Scotland, where he honed his skills and gained a deep understanding of machinery. Upon returning to the United States, he encountered the stark realities of racial prejudice, making it challenging for him to secure employment that matched his expertise. Undeterred, McCoy channeled his determination into becoming a prolific inventor. Despite the obstacles he faced due to systemic racism, McCoy's genius ultimately triumphed, earning him the respect and admiration of the engineering community. His early struggles laid the foundation for a remarkable journey of innovation and resilience that would shape the course of industrial history. The Real McCoy – Inventive Genius Elijah McCoy, known as The Real McCoy, showcased unparalleled inventive genius. McCoy's brilliance emerged during his education in Scotland, where he mastered machinery and engineering. Facing racial discrimination upon returning to the U.S., he defied the odds, inventing the automatic lubricator in 1872. This revolutionary device transformed steam engines, reducing friction and increasing efficiency. McCoy's patents extended beyond mechanics, the real McCoy, symbolizing authenticity and superior craftsmanship, making him an iconic figure in industrial history and a trailblazer for African-American inventors. Contributions to the Railroad Industry Elijah McCoy's contributions to the railroad industry stand as a testament to his transformative impact on transportation and machinery. His groundbreaking invention of the automatic lubricator, patented in 1872, revolutionized the efficiency and reliability of steam engines. This device automatically applied oil to moving parts, preventing friction and wear, thereby significantly extending the lifespan and performance of locomotives. Railroad companies quickly recognized the value of McCoy's invention, and his automatic lubricator became an essential component across the industry. Railroad engineers and manufacturers often requested McCoy's patented lubrication system, insisting on the real McCoy to ensure superior quality. The device not only improved the overall safety of rail travel, but also reduced maintenance costs and downtime. McCoy's ingenuity fundamentally changed the landscape of the railroad industry, making him a pivotal figure in the advancement of transportation technology. His contributions laid the tracks for smoother, more reliable train journeys, marking a lasting legacy in the history of industrial innovation. Patented Inventions and Innovations Elijah McCoy's legacy is etched in history through a prolific array of patented inventions and innovations that showcased his unparalleled ingenuity. Among his remarkable creations, the automatic lubricator, patented in 1872, remains a crowning achievement. This device revolutionized the efficiency of steam engines. Its impact on the railroad industry was transformative. McCoy's inventive spirit extended beyond lubrication solutions. 
He held numerous patents for devices. His innovations weren't merely mechanical. They were born out of a profound understanding of industry needs and a relentless pursuit of excellence. What set McCoy apart was the quantity of his patents and the consistent quality and practicality embedded in each. Elijah McCoy's patented inventions stand as a testament to his lasting impact on industrial progress and the enduring relevance of his ingenious contributions across various fields. Legacy and Impact on Industrial Progress Elijah McCoy's enduring legacy and profound impact on industrial progress lie in the transformative nature of his inventions, particularly the automatic lubricator. His innovations not only revolutionized steam engine efficiency, but became a gold standard for reliability and excellence. A legacy encapsulated by the moniker, the real McCoy. Beyond his mechanical genius, McCoy broke racial barriers, becoming a trailblazer for African-American inventors during a time of pervasive discrimination. His success catalyzed greater inclusivity in innovation. The real McCoy's inventions reverberated across the industrial landscape, fostering increased efficiency and reduced maintenance costs in the railroad industry. His legacy stands as a testament to the monumental influence that individual brilliance, determination, and resilience can exert on industrial progress, shaping a future where innovation knows no bounds. Recognition and Honors Elijah McCoy's invaluable contributions to industrial progress earned him well-deserved recognition and honors, solidifying his place as a pioneering figure in engineering. Despite facing the challenges of racial prejudice, McCoy's brilliance was acknowledged by the industry, leading to numerous accolades. His automatic lubricator garnered widespread acclaim, and its adoption by major railroad companies spoke volumes about its transformative impact. McCoy's recognition extended beyond industry circles. In 1920, he was granted membership in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, a prestigious acknowledgement of his engineering prowess. His inventive spirit and dedication to excellence were celebrated, and he became a symbol of inspiration for aspiring inventors, particularly within the African-American community. Posthumously, McCoy's legacy continued to receive accolades. His achievements were commemorated with inductions into various halls of fame, underlining his enduring influence on technological advancements. Elijah McCoy's journey from overcoming adversity to receiving widespread recognition serves as a powerful narrative, highlighting not only his brilliance, but also the broader societal impact that arises when innovation is acknowledged and celebrated across diverse communities. Financial Challenges Elijah McCoy faced financial hardships throughout his life. Despite his prolific inventions, he struggled with limited resources, encountering challenges in funding and promoting his creations. McCoy's financial difficulties underscored the barriers African-American inventors often confronted in pursuing their innovations. Ending of his life. Elijah McCoy's life concluded with an enduring legacy. His inventive spirit and engineering prowess revolutionized the locomotive and industrial machinery. McCoy's impact on technology and society endures a testament to his remarkable contributions and an inspiration for generations to come. Death. Elijah McCoy passed away at the Eloise Infirmary in Detroit, Michigan, on October 10, 1929, at the age of 85. His final... Okay, so as you can see, although Elijah McCoy did a lot for the railroad industry, it did not pay him a lot. It didn't pay him a lot of money. It didn't pay a lot of money, but at the end of the day, he was able to do something to the railroad system that's still that that's it's probably been modified because of course he died a long, long time ago, but it's still being modified to today, right? It's all right. So let's go ahead and talk about the next person. Now, stagecoach Mary, she never did anything directly to the railroad system, but she protected packages see before you had fedex ups and all of these other people 
you had to give your packages to the Pony Express if it was, you know, valuable. Porch Pirates ain't just started today. Porch Pirates been going on for a long time. And what I'm saying is you have people have always stolen people's packages. But Stagecoach Mary is not to be played with. Right. So let's go play this. The characters in the heart of they fall. And if this is the kind of content that you enjoy, please hit the subscribe button. Also, you can find more content like this in my channel and at onemichistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by clicking my Patreon page in the description below. But without further ado, let's get started. Stagecoach Mary is played by Zazie Beats, and her stagecoach Mary is Nat Love's romantic interest, and she owns a saloon and is a burlesque dancer. The real life stagecoach Mary was much older and at least six foot and 200 plus pounds. She was the first African American female star right male carrier in the United States. Mary Fields was born in 1832. Fields was born into slavery, and like many enslaved people, the exact date of her birth is unknown, and even her birthplace is in question. There is very little known about her early life and what she did in the years immediately following the Civil War and her emancipation, because enslaved people were treated like property, and their numbers were recorded, but their names weren't. So after she was freed, she went up the Mississippi River working on riverboats and acting as a servant and a laundress. In the 1870s, she became a housekeeper at the Ursuline Convent in Toledo, Ohio, where she formed a close relationship with Mother Amadeus. Fields was, like I said, six feet tall and more than 200 pounds, so she was capable of doing what was regarded as men's work as well as the standard housekeeping chores such as maintenance, repairs laundry, gardening, growing vegetables, tending chickens, repairing buildings, and she eventually became the forewoman. In 1884, Mother Amadeus was sent to Montana Territory to establish a school for Native American girls at the St. Peter's Mission. Later, when Mother Amadeus was stricken with pneumonia, Fields hurried to Montana to nurse her back to health. When Mother Amadeus recovered, Fields stayed at the St. Peter's Mission, and despite her devotion to the nuns, she drank heavily in saloons with men and had a reputation of a quick temper and apparently the nuns complained about her difficult nature. In any case, the bishop at the Montana Diocese ordered the convent to dismiss Fields. Kicked out of the convent in 1895, she got a contract from the post office to become a star route mail carrier. Not an actual employee of the United States Postal Service because they didn't hire or employ mail carriers for star routes. A star route was a term used for a connection between the United States Postal Service and the contracting mail delivery services. Star route contracts were given to the lowest qualifying bid, and once a contract wasn't awarded, the contractor could either drive the route himself, sublet the route, or hire an experienced driver. Some individuals obtained multiple star route contracts and conducted operations as a business. Mary, as an independent contractor, carried mail using a stagecoach donated by Mother Amadeus. She was only the second woman in the United States and the first African American woman to serve in that role, and it suited Mary Fields to a T. And as a star route, her job was to protect the mail and her routes from thieves and bandits and deliver the mail at all costs. Her dedication and reliability in this difficult, often dangerous task earned her the nickname Stagecoach Mary. She worked for the Postal Service for eight years over two four-year contracts from 1895 to 1899 and from 1899 to 1903. Afterwards, she retired. She operated a laundry service, reportedly babysat children, and she continued to drink heavily in saloons and was such a beloved figure in Cascade, Montana, that the townspeople rebuilt her home after it caught fire in 1912. Fields would die in 1914 at the Columbus Hospital in Great Falls, and her funeral was said to be one of the largest the town had ever seen. And this has been the story of stagecoach Mary Fields. And if this is the kind of content that you. The reason why I paid play information about stagecoach uh, coach Mary 
uh, I played that video. That's fair use. It's because she actually contributed so much uh, protecting packages doing Pony Express for the you know the military and things like that. So let's talk about the next person on that list, and it's Robert Church Sr. Um, he played a significant role in bringing the road road system through Tennessee, specifically, I believe he's from Memphis, but, um, uh, let's play this video. White steamboat owner, Charles B. Church. Although he was born enslaved, his life was far from what one could imagine. After his mother's death, when he was 12, Robert began traveling up and down the Mississippi with his father. He began working first as a cabin boy and eventually he became a steward. After surviving a nearly fatal steamboat explosion, Church was captured by the Union and served as a steward. After the Civil War, Church settled in Memphis in the 1860s. There, he began to establish himself as an entrepreneur and would later become one of the city's first pioneers. He initially owned a saloon, and during the Memphis Massacre of 1866, a white mob ransacked his saloon, and he was shot and left for dead during the attack. Refusing to be deterred, Church remained in Memphis. And while the real estate market was depressed due to the yellow fever epidemic of 1878, Church purchased considerable amounts of undervalued real estate, including a hotel and a restaurant. This further established him as a prominent businessman, as well as the South's first black millionaire. Noticing a lack in recreational facilities for blacks in Memphis, Church bought a tract of land on Beale Street and built an auditorium and landscaped the grounds. He named the area Church Park and it was valued at $100,000. He sponsored graduation ceremonies, political rallies, and shows at the park. Several acts performed there, including the father of the blues, W.C. Handy, and speeches were given there by Booger T. Washington, and President Teddy Roosevelt. In the first decade of the 20th century, Church found the Solvent Savings Bank and Trust Company, one of the first privately owned black banks in America and the first of its kind in Memphis. Throughout his life, he gave freely to local schools, churches, and civic organizations. Church also helped bring Memphis out of bankruptcy by purchasing a municipal bond in 1896. Robert Reed Church Sr. was a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and millionaire. He was a prominent businessman in the South and one of the most prolific African Americans in history. If you enjoy watching our videos and would like and to have a thing hand he didn't in point prayer, out is this Robert Church Sr. also had a hand to play. All right, so let's look at this real quick in the railroad system as well. All right. So. Okay, so Robert J. Church was established himself as an author and authority on rail railroad subjects. So. He played a significant role um, as a railroad page and he developed his railroad systems as well. So he, he did a lot to the railroad system. So um, you probably want to look more for him. And lastly, we want to speak about, um, and I spoke about this on in another video, and this is Cole Wagler, um, which is now a restaurant. I'm recording. With, you know, um, which is now a river, but it was a black town. But let's play more of this. Out into the lake on a peninsula. One can recognize it by a tall wooden statue of an Indian standing in the front of the restaurant. It's the very same wooden Indian from Hank Williams' song, Kalija, the story of a wooden Indian who fell in love with an Indian maid. However, not many people know that some 80 feet beneath the waterline lies the town of Kalija. Even though one of the rare prosperous majority black communities in the South at the turn of the 20th century, Kalija is now nothing more than another chapter in the less known history of the United States. The history of Kalija is a short but fascinating story of a thriving black community. It's a tale of a group of men and their families determined to build lives out of the ashes of the Civil War in the racially segregated South. In just a half century, 
the hardworking black men and women turned a neglected land along Kalijah Creek into a promising industrial and farming community. Its development, however, was interrupted by the same progress they strived for. Kalijah and the entire area along the Tallapoosa River found themselves in the way of the Alabama Power Company, which in 1916 obtained the right to build a dam on the river. When the dam was finished in 1926, life for the Kalijah community and other settlements along the river ended. Once the dam gates were closed, the river flooded the area and sent Kalijah into the depths of the newly created Lake Martin. Back in the days after the Civil War, Alabama was still a dangerous place for black people. Even though President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, many black slaves were still held in bondage in Alabama and other states of the South. A slave named John, who worked on a plantation in Kalijah Creek, had become a free man after the war ended. Free, but all alone, John decided to build his life from scratch. He took the surname of his master, James Benson, and went to look for his lost sister. During the age of slavery, it was a common thing to separate family members. John's sister was separated from him when they were still children and was sold to a landlord in Florida. John undertook a risky endeavor wandering the lands of Florida, but was finally rejoined with his sister. Together, the two of them returned to Alabama, where John found a job in Cahaba Field Coal Mines in Shelby County. Mining coal was a difficult job, even for the work-hardened man John was. He was paid only 60 cents per ton mined, but managed to save $100 by 1880. It was quite a large amount of money for anyone at the time, let alone a former slave. The money was the initial capital that John Benson used to buy land along Kalaja Creek. Good crops and the favorable price of cotton allowed John to grow his wealth. Finally, after a decade of hard work, he had enough money to buy 160 acres of his former master James Benson's land, the land that was part of the very same plantation where he used to work as a slave. John was anything but an idle man. He worked day and night on his cotton farm. Unlike the old times when he worked for food and shelter, now his hard work paid off. By 1898, John Benson accumulated substantial wealth. He had over 3,000 acres of land, a brickyard, a sawmill, a grist mill, and a cotton gin with a compressing mill. Along with 40 other families, both black and white, he planted corn, cotton, and sugarcane. 1,000 acres of his land covered with pine, oak, and hickory provided abundant resources for the sawmill. Once an enslaved man, John Benson was now a wealthy landowner. His most significant wealth, however, was the community of farmers he created. Each of them had a job and a house of his own. There was even a tiny cabin schoolhouse where kids were provided basic education. It was something most black people in the South could only dream of. The community John Benson created was just an indication of what Kalijah was about to become. John's son, William Benson, inherited his father's vision of creating the reason why I'm playing this full video is because we want to speak about not this John, but his son, William Benson, because he was the one who actually founded Dixie Line. Dixie Line was the train system that, well, he, he developed a community and a school, but he also started Dixie Line, which was a railroad company that was successful, but it went out of business during the, during the Civil War. But let's continue a prosperous black community and took it to a higher level. William was one of three children John and his wife Julia had. John insisted all his children were provided a proper college education. William started his education at Fisk University and finished it in 1895 at Howard College in Washington with a Bachelor of Arts degree. Even though people expected the young man to stay up north and build his career in a more emancipated environment, William decided to return home. The desire to improve a community his father started to create was stronger than anything else. In 1895, when William returned home eager to build up his community, Alabama was still far from an emancipated society. However, the period between the Civil War and the turn of the 20th century was marked by some progress in relations between blacks and whites in the South. One could have even seen both sitting together in a restaurant or a theater. On the other side, in 1895, at least eight black men and women were lynched in Alabama. For this reason, William's ideas were even more important for improving the conditions of life for the black people in the South. Being a man of education himself, William knew that the only way to reach prosperity was through education and started collecting the funds to build a school. William's father, John, recognized his son's ideas and helped him by donating 10 acres of land for the school campus and lumber for the school building. Two years after the project started, the Kalaja Academic and Industrial Institute was finished. William managed to gather some prominent names in the school board, including Clinton Joseph Calloway, the school's first director, and Booker T. Washington, founder of Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute for Negroes. 
The peculiarity of the school was that its goal was not to produce highly educated students. Instead, William intended to train the students for life and work in their home community and prepare those ambitious to gain additional education in more developed educational centers. He thought that skilled and educated workers were necessary to build up the economy, which would spur the community's overall progress. To achieve this goal, in 1900, William Benson organized the Dixie Industrial Company, an enterprise where students could put their training into practical use. Such a company was planned to take the Kalijah farming community to a new, higher level, transforming the natural resources into finished goods for sale. In the same way, he established the Kalijah Academic and Industrial Institute, William did a marvelous job setting up an industrial center for the village. Dixie Industrial Company comprised one of the most modern sawmills in the South, the largest turpentine distillery in the region, and a cotton ginnery. The company's farming business spread over 10,000 acres of land and employed 300 people, of which 30 were whites. Black and white families of the Kalijah community lived and worked in relative harmony. William's ideal was to secure a job for all of them, including children in the school. His plans went far beyond this as he wanted to attract black people from other villages to come to Kalaja. In 1898, he declared an intention to spend more of his own money to build a new community for poor black families. He hired William Gray Purcell for the job, at the time a student of architecture, and got the sketches for the dwellings and the town center done. Unfortunately, the project was abruptly abandoned when an angry white mob, jealous of Benson's wealth, lynched a black man and stormed William's house. The setbacks were many, as most white folks were unwilling to see the Kalijah black community thrive. William Benson, however, never backed away. He never lost hope for a better tomorrow, not even when Kalijah Academic and Industrial Institute was burned to the ground. Instead, he started it all over, gathered contributions, and ultimately built a new school campus. There was no end to William's plans and will to develop his small community. One of the things that they still lacked in the first decade of the 20th century was proper communication infrastructure. Kalijah was connected to nearby towns with curvy, often muddy mountain roads. It affected not only the transport of people, but of goods as well. The solution was to build a railroad. William got to work and convinced several English and Canadian firms to finance the railroad that would connect Kalijah with Alexander City. In 1914, the first black-owned railroad in the United States was opened. 16 miles of railroad connecting Kalijah to the Alabama Railway Network allowed Dixie Industrial Company to transport lumber and other goods to large trading centers and seaports. The railroad proved itself a great success as Dixie Company began exporting goods to Europe, with Germany being a major customer. That same year, the downfall of the Kalijah community began. When the war started in Europe, the Atlantic port was closed and the Dixie Company lost an important market. In the following year, due to financial problems, William Benson lost control of both the Kalijah Academic and Industrial Institute and the Dixie Industrial Company to the Board of Trustees. His already aggravated health worsened, and in October 1915, William Benson died. He was buried on the campus of the Kalijah Institute, the place he invested his whole life into. In 1916, the Alabama Power Company obtained the right to build a dam on the Tallapoosa River and sealed the destiny of the Kalijah community. When 10 years later, the water began to fill the creek and form Lake Martin, Kalanje Industrial and Academic Institute closed its doors. The community of thriving black people ceased to exist. Almost a century later, thousands of people passed the Kalanje Bridge on Lake Martin, unaware that beneath them, the remains of the picturesque village, a community of black people who strive to build themselves a life worthy of man. For more videos on the most amazing Okay, so I definitely want to showcase a lot of, um, and I'm going to do more of these type videos because at the end of the day, people need to know that black, the black community or the black population in America did have thriving communities. But the problem is every time we had a chance, every time we had a chance to further increase the development of these communities was throughout by hate and was destroyed and because of this um there are no black communities or successful black communities here in america so nevertheless this is antonio with team tigio please like comment subscribe as we'll be coming to you more videos in the future and once again we will see you in the next video